We're on. We're live recording, everyone, so be careful. I need to find Norm Spax. I can't find him. I'll unmute him. So I have to do this uh, manually. So Brad is good. He's not. Uh, I just need to find Norm, his cousin. Danny? Yes. When people join after you did the mute all thing, they yeah. are not muted. You so you need to go Danny? through. You need to go through manually and mute each one who joined after you muted. Also, people tend to unmute themselves when they couldn't. I did, but I'm going to turn myself back to mute in a moment. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Danny. I just need to find Norm Specs. And once I find Norm and unmute him, we're going to be good to go to start. I have Elliot Specs. My brother. I need to start video. Okay. I just did it. Okay. I just did it. Okay. Oh, they see? Okay, they see. Norm looks Norm's unmuted, there. Danny. Norm's there. Norm's, Norm's good. Heard. Norm, you're good. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Good evening, everyone. We, uh, we're very excited to have everyone here. I'm going to just make sure that everyone is muted. If, if you are not Brad or Norm, um, I would ask that you please, and you're not muted, if the little red thing, little microphone is not lit up red with a cross around it, over it, I would ask you please to mute yourself. We have a very yeah. big crowd tonight. <clears throat> And someone I hear in the background is not. So I would ask you please to, because I can't, I'm having a hard time finding everyone. How are you so talking? many. Um, okay, I just found another Danny, one. Danny, if you go to participants, you will, everybody's name will come up. There'll be a little microphone symbol. Yeah. You can manually mute each one, okay? Yeah, I uh, think I got everyone. It's quiet. Yes, good. All right, we're good to go. So this is our um, third FJMC baseball webinar. And uh, for those of you that are new to us, welcome. And for those of you that have joined us before, um, we're very excited to have our special guest tonight, Brad Osmus. Um, and um, I'm going to do a, a little intro on him and then uh, introduce you to his cousin, Norm Spax from my shul, who is the reason that we were able to get Brad to be with us tonight. So Brad is a former professional baseball manager and catcher in the major leagues. He had 18 years of playing uh, for the Padres, the Tigers, the Astros, and the Dodgers. And he was also a manager of the Tigers and the Angels and of the Israel national baseball team. He's a five-time league leader at catcher in fielding percentage. He also led the league twice each in range factor and in percentage caught stealing and once in each putouts and assists. So how's that? I'll just tell you one other tidbit that I did find out about Brad that I think this group in particular um, will really appreciate. He was known as a brilliant defensive catcher, an incredibly smart catcher. And what his quote when asked about being one of the baseball's smartest players, he said, I feel like when they say I'm one of the smartest ball players, it's just their way of saying I don't hit very much. So I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, and finally, um, Brad was inducted into the National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame in 2004. And to quote him, I had a quite a few young Jewish boys who will tell me that I am their favorite player, or they love watching me play, or they feel like baseball is a good fit for them because it worked for me, or it worked for Sean Green, or other Jewish players in a major league level. It's been a sense of pride, and if you can have a positive impact on a kid, I'm all for it. 
So I'm, um, I'm now going to introduce to you his cousin, Norm Spax, from Temple Emanuel in Newton, Massachusetts, a 50-year uh, endocrinologist with Harvard, um, and a proud member of the Cole Emanuel Choir. And he was, uh, we were fortunate enough for Norm to not go to choir practice, but he's going to sing for us later. That's what, right, Norm? No. <laughs> and uh, Norm, t uh, take it away, and you can uh, start with your cousin, Brad. OK. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and I'll explain a number of things about how I'm related to Brad and what his yichas is. Brad, do you know what yichas is? He's a bit of I, a late starter. I don't, I don't. It, it, it's a combination of your inheritance, your, um, your heritage, um, and it's always said in the positive. He's got yichas. And let me tell you, when I think about your great grandparents, your grandparents, your grand and your mom and dad, you you definitely have got yichas. Yichas is something you can have, but you can't make. <laughs> it's your family history. Um, so things start with four Friedman sisters, ages eight to 16. Um, eight-year-old Ida to 16-year-old Etta, arriving from Lithuania to Boston's North End in 1890. Eventually, I would be Etta's grandson, and Brad would be Ida's great-grandson. So Ida marries Joe, and they settle in Worcester, where Joe an insurance man was a pillar of his synagogue. Hold on one second. There's someone who has shared their screen that needs to please get that off immediately because it's messing up this entire presentation. So whoever you are, whoever just shared a screen, I can't get rid of it because I don't know what you... Uh, it's Howard Cohen. Howard Cohen, please. You have okay. to restrict screen sharing to, to... Okay, Howard Cohen, please get off. You need, you need to please get off this entire thing because you're, it's... Howard Cohen, please exit the Zoom. Just and you can... Su I'm gonna have to, yeah, I have to find you then. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. So your, your great-grandfather was a pillar of a synagogue he often filled in for the shamas, the sexton, who organized services and made sure they had uh, 10 men uh, to begin the service. And uh, he and your great-grandmother had four boys and two girls, including Adele, who was your grandmother. In time, Adele takes training in, as a dietitian. She, she moves east, settling with her husband, Jack Dronzik, in Brookline, and becomes a truly distinguished dietitian. Um, she was in charge of the hospital-based internship that all dietitians have to take for a year at the Beth Israel, and she did this for 40 years. She was also, at one time, the president of the American Dietetic Association. These are big time organizations. Now, Adele and Jack have a daughter, Linda. Our mothers, um, Adele and my mother were pregnant together and Linda and I were born 10 days apart. Um, we always considered that somewhat of a, a special bond. And in many respects, through high school anyway, Linda was as close as a sister to, uh, to being a sister to me as, as anyone. She was a charter member of what we used to call, or they used to call the Runkle Girls. These were a group of girls becoming young women 
who um, continue to get together now as we reach our 60th reunion. Um, alas, uh, Linda did not live to see this tonight. Uh, she passed away a few years ago. And I know that there are a number of the Runkle girls are here tonight in many respects in her memory. Linda received a confirmation at Temple Israel. Her brother David was a counselor and my as my brother and I were at Camp Tevya. I'm gonna need some help from you, Brad. Linda married Harry Osmus, a PhD in history specializing in the history of philosophy at Southern Connecticut State College. I remember, Brad, that uh, Dan Shaughnessy followed uh, one of his regular com columns with a little coda. It said, these are the following books written by Harry Osmus. And I, I couldn't understand any of them. <laughs> Could you share one or two? Nor, nor me. I actually, I actually read all of my father's books. I think he had four of them. Uh, the first one was called uh, uh, The Polite Escape, The Myth of Secularization. And he had three others, and I did read all of them. Uh, I could not easily summarize any of them for you, and they are not light reading. Thank you. Um, so your, your, your parents settled in Cheshire, Connecticut, in more outside of um, New Haven than, than, Hart to, than to Hartford. And you were born there and grew up there. Now, Southern Connecticut is really a haven for Yankee fans, as opposed to Hartford, who are more likely to be Red Sox fans. Yeah, the closer, you know, you're kind of in no man's land when you get in between New Haven and Hartford. Um, the closer you get to New York, the more Yankee fans you get. The closer you get to Boston, the more Red Sox fans you get. Uh, I didn't really have a choice. My mom grew up in Brookline, so uh, it, was, it was Red Sox all the way. I used to listen to the Red Sox on WTIC 1080 in Connecticut every night, fall asleep to it. Um, you know, when they came on the game of the week, because back then was pre-cable, and we didn't have a lot of options like we do now to watch games. Uh, you know, I'd watch it on, uh, on the game of the week. And then when we would come to the Cape uh, during the summers, my parents would rent a place on the Cape for a week or two weeks during the month of August. I would actually get to watch the games on a daily basis on, uh, on Channel 38 out of Boston. So uh, there really was no choice. It was, uh, I was a Red Sox fan from the day I was born. How unique was that among your, your, your peer group? It was pretty split. You know, there was some, some Yankee fans and there were some, some Red Sox fans. Uh, but I was one of those kids who, you know, again, pre-internet, I would get up every morning, open the paper and see how I all, you know, how all the Red Sox players did look at the box score, look at the lineup. Um, I, I did this on a daily basis. I just, I loved, uh, I loved the Red Sox as a kid. It, there's a lot of good memories. I still remember walking in the very first time. I think it was 1976. I walked into Fenway Park. Uh, I had never been in a big league stadium, and it was unbelievable to me that you could walk in the middle of this concrete city, and there's this bright green grass, and the players look so big. And uh, it, was, uh, it was, I think it was the the year after Fred Lynn won the MVP and the Rookie of the Year, so I was uh, I was very much a baseball rat. Brad, I think my hat would be consistent with that year. Yeah, it looks like it came from that year. Actually, it looks yeah. like you bought yeah. it in that year. Right. <laughs> um, religion wasn't a big thing in your home, right? No. Yeah. We were, my, you know, my mom was raised in a Jewish household. My dad was uh, Protestant uh, and we didn't, you know, I didn't really go to church. I didn't go to synagogue. Uh, I would, because my mom's family was closer in the Massachusetts area, 
I would go for the holidays, whether it was Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, or Hanukkah. We would usually spend that at my aunt's house in Worcester, uh, where we all we'd gather together and we'd have a big meal together. Um, but Kravitz, are you a, listening to this, Kravitz? It was not a huge. <laughs> it was not a huge thing in the household. Right. Um, Hey, hey, Brad, just, just want to, if you guys have questions, by the way, um, you should put them in the chat, and then um, I will uh, share those with him. Brad, okay. um, you played key positions on your high school basketball team. You were a point guard. Uh, is it really true you could dunk when you were 5'8"? <laughs> well, hold on, <laughs> hold up on the 5'8". I wasn't quite that short. Um, <laughs> I was uh, 5'11". I could dunk, yes. That was actually something I could do. Um, uh, basketball, you know, when I get into high school, I actually probably enjoyed basketball more than baseball for a period of time. When I was really young, it was all baseball. I got into high school, it was more basketball. Um, but I was just much better at baseball. And the more I played the game of baseball, especially once I got into the minor leagues and the major leagues, I really became became enchanted with kind of the games within the games, the cat and mouse, uh, the strategy. Uh, that's when the full love of baseball took place. It was more than just a kid looking at box scores every morning. That's when I, I kind of was able to grasp the ins and out of the sport. But I know of other catchers who didn't actually start catching until they were halfway through high school. Um, did you go right in? as a catcher when you were ninth grade, 10th grade? I, I actually have been catching since I was, oh, Little League. Um, I started catching in Little League because we had a pitcher who threw really hard and I was the only guy who could actually catch him. Uh, other than my seventh grade year in, in middle school and my sophomore year in high school, which I played second and shortstop, other than those two years, I've caught every year of my life. Well, and who did, would you try to emulate among the, uh, the professional catchers of your time? You know, it's funny. I, I didn't really try to emulate anyone. Carlton Fisk was the big guy in Boston at the time. Then Rich Gedman. Um, I didn't really try to emulate them. I just kind of caught. My favorite player was Jim Rice, who was a left fielder, obviously. Uh, so I, there wasn't really a catcher that I tried to emulate. I just, I just kind of did my thing. Do you want to tell the story or shall I tell the story about your first time to, to Fenway and Rice was a hitting coach and they had Go interviewed ahead. you. As a, you, can, you can tell it. I want to hear it because I don't remember it now. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, I think the, 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 the uh, sports writers were somewhat taken aback when they interviewed you on your first arrival to Fenway as a Detroit Tiger, and they asked you that question, who's your favorite player? And you said, Jim Rice. And you know, they have, many of them had some difficulties with Rice. He was, he was I should say, um, a great player, but who was also somewhat prickly, especially in the locker room. Um, so you said that, and then there was a game later that day, and um, you, you came out and Jim Rice came out of the dugout to shake your hand and pat you on the back. And you could, I, I just know what was going on there, that he was so proud that, you know, you didn't have to be an African-American guy to like Jim Rice, that you, um, you saw the pure quality in it. No, I was, I was a big Jim Rice fan. I had, uh, I had met him on the field in Boston. I, uh, we played in golf tournaments together, actually on Cape Cod. Um, I was, I was a huge fan. I, you know, I don't, at the, at the time I was young, so I certainly wasn't too concerned with what the pundits were saying about Jim Rice as a person. I just liked him as a player. And uh, I actually, as, a, as a side note, years ago now, I guess it might, it might be, Ooh, 15 years ago, maybe for my fifth anniversary, my wife had a, a painting done for me. And the painting is actually from the point of view of the left field foul pole, looking at 
the green monster towards right field scoreboard. And it's Jim Rice making a play up against the green monster. And mm-hmm. I have that hanging in my office to this day. He, uh, um, when, when did you start to get scouted and by whom? Well, you know what? It's a funny story because I, I do kind of owe this to my mom. Uh, somebody must have at some point, because I, I, was, I was just a kid. I was probably 15 or 16. Uh, somebody must have told my mom that I might have a shot to, to play a, a, in some way at the professional ranks. So she signed me up for an open tryout in Middletown, Connecticut. I, I grew up, like you said, outside in Haven. So she signed me up for an open tryout in Middletown, Connecticut, and didn't even ask me about it. She just signed me up and said, we're going to go to this. Um, so we go to the tryout and they, you know, you have to run a 60 yard dash. You have to, they, they have to watch you throw as, as a catcher. They have to watch you throw to second. Um, and, uh, they take batting practice and you, and then at the end they play a game. So they play like a, a, a scrimmage. And what happened was, you know, I caught a few innings and then I hit and then they had me hit again. And then they had me hit a third time back to back to back. Like I, I, I grounded out. They said, Hey Brad, go hit again. So I hit again. I flew out. They said, Hey, go hit again. I hit again. I, I don't remember what happened. And they said, okay, tryouts over. So that's when something clicked in my mind, like, well, that was a little strange. Why did they have me hit three straight times? Um, so I think that's when I, I kind of was on the radar. That's when the, the blip was on the radar for the scouts. And then my senior year, very first game at home at Cheshire High School, I go down for batting practice and, and infield practice. And in the stands where, keep in mind, in April in Cheshire, Connecticut, there's nobody sitting in the stands for batting practice and infield practice. There's probably a dozen scouts. Um, and that just kind of solidified. And then I actually would receive mail from organiza- from scouts from the Blue Jays or the Expos at the time. And uh, uh, it just kind of built from there. You were a catcher on the Connecticut All-State team, right? Yes. And another, another member of that team was Jeff Bagwell, who was destined to become your teammate in the Astros. Right. And yeah, Jeff and Jeff and I, I didn't know Jeff. We were all state together. He was a year ahead of me, so he was a senior, I was a junior, and we were both on the all state team. Uh, but I never talked to Jeff until we played against each other, just kind of in passing. Hello, you know, we we both knew each the names we both were from Connecticut uh, but we became very close when I was traded to the Astros in 97 uh, so 97 98 and then 2001 through 2008 uh, Jeff and I play together we, we still remain extremely close friends um, talk to him you know on a regular basis uh, but it, it was strange that we grew up probably 25 miles from each other but really didn't become good friends until we played played against each other or played with each other uh, about 10 years later. Hey, Norm. <clears throat> Norm. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay, so I have probably 15 questions already. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop your interview for a minute because I don't want, I want everyone to get a fair shot in their questions and then we can go back to um, – <clears throat> To your this is a good this is a good place to stop because we're going to talk about his going up going into the, the, the college baseball dilemma. All right, right. Brad. Is that so, a Brad? Word? First question: yep. Why is it? Do you feel that catchers make really great managers? And who was your favorite coach? Uh, well, I think catchers have a unique perspective. Catchers have to deal with the pitchers on a regular basis uh, both from a game planning standpoint but also from sort of a psychological standpoint because catchers become sounding boards for pitchers but catchers also understand how difficult it is to play on an everyday basis for 162 games and uh, 
they understand how difficult it is to hit and how in hitting you can go from extremes of 0 for 15 to 7 for 12. Uh, so they, they have a, a very even keel perspective, uh, not to mention that a bunch of the strategy in the game of baseball goes through the catcher to the field. Interesting. Great. Okay. So the other question. Oh, wait, I, I didn't answer. I didn't answer a coach. You asked. Right, me right. So I'm going to answer two because it, it, they're both related. Okay. okay. Who was your favorite coach and who was the best pitcher that you ever caught? Um, you know, there are a number of managers or coaches that have contributed to, to my career. I learned a lot. Part of it was because at the time I was trying to absorb a lot, but I learned a lot when I played in LA for my last two years with Joe Torrey there. Uh, that doesn't mean other managers didn't have impacts. Uh, I really enjoyed Buddy Bell when I was in Detroit in 96, uh, and Bruce Bochy. Of course, although I actually learned more, I was young when I played for Bruce Bochy, so I wasn't really in tune with gaining knowledge as much as I was trying to establish myself in the big leagues. I actually learned more from Bruce, Bruce Bochy playing against his teams and watching his, uh, his strategy uh, in the other dugout. Excellent. Um, and what, was the, what was the other part of that question? Who was the best pitcher you did? You oh, ever... best pitcher. Uh, you know, I've caught a lot of very good pitchers. I have always said if I needed somebody to pitch a game to save the human race, I would pick Andy Pettit. Wow. Oh. Dave Brown well, just got upset. Uh, uh, <laughs> Roger <laughs> Clemens, who, who with Pettit, came to the uh, Astros at the end of their careers. Um, and Clemens was heard to say that you were the best catcher he ever threw to. Now, Rocket is, uh, I would put Rocket right up there. Rocket won a Cy Young when we played together. Um, he's, he's one of the best teammates I've ever been around. Um, you know, for, for such a big personality, he's really very down to earth when you, are sitting in a room with him. He's, he cares, he cares about his teammates. He cares about winning the game. He's very intense. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, like I said, I would pick Andy Pett if I had to, but rocket would be right up there. So I'll give you one more and then we'll go back to the interview. And we have a lot of questions, but I'm trying to keep them sort of bunched and related. So as a manager, what analytics have you found to be the most helpful? Well, I mean, that's a, a very broad question because analytics are used in a number of fashions. You know, a lot of them are used for player evaluation. Um, you know, whether it's miss percentage, chase percentage. If you look at pitchers, you could look at uh, the – I mean, I could get into the, the X and Y grid of the breaks of pitches, break charts – uh, you, it's it's very difficult to just say there's one number you look at because different positions require different numbers. Um, uh, and some numbers, really, you can spin some numbers to say what you want. So it's a little bit of a balance. Uh, it's there, There's so many different numbers now. The advancement of TrackMan and the advancement of uh, StatCast has made evaluation and especially stack cast on the defensive side, defensive evaluation, it's, it's completely revolutionized it. And there's no one number. Okay. All right, Norm, go back to it. I have a lot more uh, questions, but we'll. Yeah, well, you, let's take it back to your acceptance to Dartmouth, which you had always wanted to go to. And um, that was your dream. On the other hand, there was the issue of how do you balance that desire with when you decided that maybe you would give it a chance to, um, to sign for a pro contract? Yeah, I had two, two 
college kids across who lived across the street from me, both of them went to Dartmouth. So I, I always wanted to go to Dartmouth because they brought me back a t-shirt. I used to wear this Dartmouth t-shirt around. Um, so I, I committed to go to Dartmouth and of course it's Ivy League school. There's no scholarships or anything like that. And then the Yankees drafted me in June and, and now I have to decide, uh, do I want to go to school or do I want to go play pro ball? And uh, initially, when I met with the scouts, I said, I'm going to go back to school. And ironically, I, like I am now, I was, in, I was in Cape Cod. The scouts came, sat down with me and my parents and, and, and uh, at lunch and, and off, gave me a, you know, a financial offer. And I just said, no, I'm, I'm going to go to college. The next day, I was driving home because they said, if you change your mind in the next 24, 48 hours, let us know. I was driving home and on the ride home, I changed my mind and uh, actually ended up being a very good decision. They allowed me to go to my first full freshman year at Dartmouth before I started playing. Um, I was able to uh, bounce back and forth between playing and going to college because Dartmouth was on a quarter system and it fit very well with the minor league system and really wasn't an issue until I, I got invited to big league camp. Uh, but the, the, co the professors worked with me in terms of getting the exams done early. Uh, it ended up being a perfect fit. It was happenstance. I didn't plan it that way. Um, but the quarter system and the minor league system uh, work well together. It, as I recall, you would go to um, the first quarter of every year. And you didn't have to report to spring training till around... Uh, February 20th or so. Well, I'd, I'd, go, I'd go to the first quarter. I normally would go to the first quarter, which is the fall quarter. And then I would actually go to the winter quarter, which started right after New Year's and ended the first week of March. Um, so with the minor league spring training starting the first week of March, I might have to take the exams a couple of days early, but I was able to make it to spring training. It wasn't really a conflict until I got invited to big league camp, which started third week of February. Now I had to really take the exams early. Uh, but like I said, the, the professors, they worked with me on it and uh, it was able to, I was able to get it done. So I, I want to make it clear to the audience that being a pro meant you could not play for Dartmouth. No, I couldn't. I couldn't play. I couldn't play baseball obviously for Dartmouth. I actually, the Yankees who drafted me, uh, ironically, because I was a Red Sox fan growing up, uh, the Yankees were going to allow me to play basketball because, uh, like I mentioned, in high school, I really enjoyed basketball. But Ivy League rules say no professional athletes can play any sport. In most divisions or conferences, you just can't play the sport that you're a professional in. But in the Ivy League, if you're a pro in any sport, that excludes you from all sports. You you did uh, you were an assistant coach your first year when you were there the whole year. Well, I, would, I wouldn't say I was assistant coach. I was a I was basically a uh, bullpen catcher. I would work out with the team. The the coach allowed me to work out with the team, and I would I would catch their pitchers. So uh, that only lasted the first year because I did go to the my freshman year uh, in entirety. But uh, that after that it, it disappeared. So, meanwhile, when you're moving up the ladder every year, you start out in instructional league and then uh, single A, double A, triple A, you're now with the Columbus Clippers, and, and then it's November 1992, the expansion draft to add two teams to the National League to equate the number of teams in each league. The yeah. Florida Mar Marlins and Colorado Rockies were created. You were protected by the Yankees, protected from the draft for two, for, for two rounds, right? No, I, I, I wasn't protected, no. Well, I thought that was the third that they let you go unprotected because they no. thought the other t they had three catchers on each team. No, how it works how it works is they were allowed to protect fifteen, and then after someone was selected in the first round, they could protect three more, uh. and then after someone was selected in the second round, they could protect three more. 
so I wasn't protected. Uh, and I remember it vividly because I was watching the expansion draft on ESPN. I was at Dartmouth. Uh, I was living in a fraternity and I, you know, a bunch of people on my floor were also watching the draft and they announced my name and my jaw hit the floor and I heard people yelling down the hallway at the same time. Uh, and within, you know, this is pre cell phone. So within 10 minutes, I get a call from the Colorado Rockies. Um, or I should say my mom called me and said, here's the number, call the Rockies. And uh, yeah, it ended up being a great move. I went to the Rockies. I wasn't there very long. I was only there for, I went to their inaugural spring training and uh, I got traded at the trading deadline in July to the San Diego Padres and went to the big leagues. Well, I'm going to try to make it more dramatic, Brad. You were in Edmonton playing for the for the Sky Sox AAA team for the Rockies. And who called, you got the call there. You want to describe that? Um, yeah, that was just, that was the AAA manager, Brad Mills, who's now the bench coach for Terry Francona in Cleveland. Uh, Millsy called me in, uh, actually me and a couple of players and said, we've been traded. Uh, the, the other players were Andy Ashby, who was a pitcher you may know, and Doug Bockler, who pitched a little bit in the big leagues. And Andy and I, went to the big leagues with San Diego. We met the club in Chicago at Wrigley field. And, uh, we flew in mid game. Tony Gwynn was in the middle of a five hit game. Andy Bennis was, I think throwing maybe a one or two hitter. Uh, and then the next day, uh, I made my debut. Well, you got your first hit during your debut and you threw out Willie Wilson. I did not a bad guy to throw out. <laughs> Um, All right, Norm, I'm going to break. I'm going to have a little break because we have a lot of questions that we want to hear from Brad. So um, I'm going to ask. Uh, so, Brad, one of the things is this the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. And uh, there is a lot of questions uh, that are coming through the chat here about anti Semitism. And if you ever felt it, if it ever was an issue that you were Jewish. Did you ever, I mean, obviously you were with Team Israel, but in, in Major League, um, we were just, uh, there's a, several questions referring to that. And did you ever have, oh, this is a good one. Did you ever have a high holiday conflict like Sandy Koufax during the season or postseason? Oh, and one, one guy. Oh, hold uh, on, you can't give yeah. me too many questions at once. All right. <laughs> um, in answer to the first question, I did not I, – I saw one incidence of anti-Semitism in my entire major league career, uh, but it wasn't even directed at me. I was uh, – because my last name is not Jewish, I don't think people connected me unless they knew me uh, with Judaism. However, in Montreal one time, the player who was hitting behind me in the lineup was a guy named Mor Morgan Ensberg, who clearly does have a Jewish sound game, although he's not. And a fan in the stands did start yelling anti-Semitic uh, jabs at Morgan. And Morgan didn't even know what to say. Uh, I was going up to the plate as it happened, and that was the only time I've ever experienced it. Okay. Um, and then the other question was, did you ever have a conflict with uh, holidays like uh, Sandy Koufax famously missed the World Series game in Kippur? Right. No, you know, I like I, like I mentioned earlier, I, I wasn't really raised in a Jewish household, so I didn't I didn't necessarily uh, have that conflict. Uh, although I did allude to it one time, uh, I wasn't playing one day and, and on Yom Kippur and. Uh, I said that was the reason I wasn't playing as a joke. Um, so people ran with it. The media ran with it. But no, I, I actually never, because I wasn't raised in a Jewish household, I, I didn't actually not play because of a high holiday. So, and, and I, I will want, ask one more question. So it must be uh, a relative of Norm's because it's from the SPACs. What does the Torah say about sign stealing? I think he's trying to be funny. <laughs> stealing is wrong. 
Okay, we'll go back to a few more chats. You can continue on, Norm. Well, um, what, what you said about uh, not playing on Young Kipper was actually a riot because we had all known that you played on the holidays. It, it, you weren't a first year player. Um, but when they, but you said uh, you were atoning for your hitting. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I was often making fun of my hitting. Right. And yet, you know, a, a, a superior defensive catcher who bats 250 to one lifetime in 18 years, I don't know why that, that's uh, anything less than stellar. Well, I'll tell you what, if, you know, they, if they had that receiving metric back then, it might have been, I might have been a, a commodity. So um, you had 18 years as a starting catcher, and you were never on the disabled list. Now, no, I, I, was, I was once. Really? My very last year, 2010, uh, which is amazing that it's been 10 years now, but 2010, at the age of 41, or right around my birthday when I turned 41, it was the – third game of the season with the Dodgers. We played in Pittsburgh. Uh, I got hurt and I had back surgery and I, I missed the rest of the season up until the all-star break and then played the, the last half. That was the only time I was on the all uh, on the disabled list in, in those 18 years. You threw out 36% of the base dealers. You had three gold gloves, one all-star game in Fenway in 1999 when Ted Williams was honored and you were probably the only guy in the field who knew who had met Ted Williams. You, you want, want to comment on that? When yeah. Well, the Padres? yeah, I did have the opportunity. The owner of the Padres had Ted Williams over to his house and I was invited. Uh, actually, Tony Gwynn was on that field too. And Tony was also at the owner's house. So Tony and I were, were the uh, two people who had probably met him before. Uh, very unique opportunity very you know we we legitimately walked around the grounds and talked about baseball and hitting and uh, I remember Ted saying I wouldn't have hit as well nowadays because they didn't have a slider back when I played he, you know he was very forthright you were in one world series one all-star game and then when your playing days were over, you managed the Tigers for three years and more recently the, the Angels. Um, yeah. Actually, four years with the Tigers. Four. Oh. What's it like to have to follow? I know Jim Leland was wonderful to you, but what is it like to have to follow a legend like that? As a manager? Uh, yeah, Jim is great. Uh, as a matter of fact, I still talk to Jim. He, he texted me this morning and asked me if everything was okay because he knew that, that – uh, tropical storm was blown through the Northeast. Uh, he, he's tremendous. I, I didn't, I was never worried about following somebody. Uh, you know, you just kind of got to be yourself. If, if you're anything but yourself, the players will see right through it as, as a group. Players are pretty smart. Um, so I, I, that wasn't anything I was ever concerned about. And it wasn't anything I was concerned about when I went to Anaheim, you know, Mike Sosia had been there for 18 years or something. Um, and I wasn't worried about that. You just kind of got to be yourself. Could you speak to the issue of the experience of being asked to be a uh, manager for the Israel team eight years ago? Yeah, that was, it was actually, it was, I, I originally said, no, thank you. Um, but look, you know, in hindsight, I'm, I'm glad I ended up doing it. It was a blast. It was a, you know, 10 days in, in South Florida with a group of guys with somewhat similar backgrounds, all Jewish heritage. And actually some, uh, a few of the players on the team were Israeli citizens who, who grew up in Israel. Uh, and when we had the kind of spring training, so, so to speak, or, or the, you know, we, we, we didn't have much time. I think we had six or seven days to kind of prep. Um, they also brought over the Israeli national team and we kind of intermixed. So it was, uh, it was a big group of Israelis and a big group of 
Jewish Americans and it was a blast. You know, we ended up not qualifying there. I don't, I don't want to get, I don't want to sound like it's too much sour grapes, but we were, uh, it was a double elimination tournament. We were undefeated going into the, the championship game. And uh, we had already beaten, it was against Spain and we had already beaten Spain, uh, but it was winner take all. So even though we had, we were two and oh, and they were two and one, we lost the game in extra innings and, and didn't advance. So we were, uh, it was a great experience. I wasn't happy about the outcome, but I enjoyed it thoroughly. What were your feelings about Israel when from when I visited? Yeah. Oh, I I loved it. My wife and I went over there. Uh, well, the, the games were actually, like I said, in South Florida. But my wife and I went to Israel prior to the start of that. Uh, we spent a week uh, in Israel in Tel Aviv. Uh, visited Jerusalem. Uh, you know, they, they really took care of us. We visited probably the nicest baseball field in all of Israel. We uh, had some fun there, but we visited uh, Yad Vashem, we, you know, the Wailing Wall. We did, uh, I went to the Dead Sea. We, we, we did everything. Uh, and I, I even went surfing, actually. I, I surf when I live in, when I'm in San Diego. We, I even went surfing on the Mediterranean in Tel Aviv. So it was, uh, it was a blast. So, Brad, I have probably, kind of, you know, I know it's getting late, so I'll, uh, I'll get as many questions in as I can. Uh, go, go for it. Um, so I, I, let, let's do it. I'm so who was, and it's, the, it's one of these questions, who was the toughest manager you ever managed against? Toughest meaning smartest? Uh, Sure. Um, you know, the, as a manager, you kind of judge the manager on the other side of the field by the stuff they, the moves that he makes, and you go, "Yeah, I get that," or "I don't." Why is he doing that? The two guys that you, I don't ever remember thinking, "Why did he do that?" Are Joe Girardi and Buck Walter. Interesting. Okay. And one of the questions was, you've been a manager and now you're not managing. Would you like to manage again? And there's many, many Red Sox fans on this Zoom, not all, but they would like to know if you had your team to pick, what would be the Red Sox? <laughs> uh, well, so the I way would... they're playing, maybe that could be an opportunity. <laughs> Well, I mean, Ron Reneke's, you know, it's, it's, this is a tough year to, to judge any manager. Um, I would like to manage again. And I interviewed for the Red Sox job twice and didn't get it. So I'm not so sure they would interview me again. Uh, you know, the first time uh, Ben Charrington was a GM and, and they ended up working a trade for John Farrell. Um, and then the second time they ended up hiring – uh, Alex Cora. So I don't know that the Red Sox would really want to talk to me again, but certainly I would love it. I mean, I have a place in Cape Cod. I grew up a Red Sox fan. It was kind of a dream to wear a Red Sox uniform. Uh, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. So uh, thank you for your candor on that. Uh, so one of the, you know, elephant in the room, do you think that uh, based on everything going on with COVID, and the 60-game schedule and all the problems that are having. There's a couple of questions here. Do you think there's going to be a season after all? Do you think we're going to make it through? I think they will. I think they'll make it through. Um, you know, we've had a bunch of positive COVID tests with really the Marlins and the Cardinals are the two teams. Uh, I think what they're finding is that they're, it's not being transmitted on the field of play. It's happening in – in enclosed spaces, whether it's the clubhouse or when, when people are together in, in spaces that don't have ventilation. Uh, but I think they will make it through. Um, if, I don't know that it'll feel like a normal season, uh, but I, I, I really have enjoyed having the games on, you know, just watching the games. I feel like the energy is good. Even though there's no fans, the energy is good with the players. Um, yeah, I, I think they're going to make it. I, yeah, I, I think the, the one saving grace right now with the positive tests 
and I'll knock on wood, is that no one's really gotten severely sick. I think maybe Freddie Freeman might be the one guy that I've heard has been to some degree sick. Uh, but it sounds like for the most part, it's been asymptomatic and mild symptoms. Very good. Thank you. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this question. Um, is someone who, this is from a gentleman that grew up in Connecticut, no longer lives in Connecticut, but he wants to know, what is it about Connecticut that produces all these great baseball players where you live in a northern climate where you only can play baseball three months in a year, which is actually not true, but that's okay. Uh, so he, he, not, he plays a whole list of, of people here. Is it, what's in the Jeff Bagwell, Jesse Hahn, Matt Harmon, blah, blah, there's like 12 names there. So obviously, uh, so anything about Connecticut isn't in the water? <laughs> well, you probably could find <clears throat> find a lot more names out of Southern California or Texas, but I will say this because the seasons are shorter in not just Connecticut, but Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, uh, a lot of times there's, there's more of a, there's more space before you hit the ceiling for that player coming out of high school, or coming out of college, um, especially high school. When you, when you, are scouting and drafting a player out of Southern California or Texas or Florida, they've been playing baseball almost year round for years. So I don't know how much higher the ceiling is above what you're seeing right now in the cold weather States. The ceiling's probably a little bit higher because they haven't had the exposure to the game of baseball as much as the warm weather States. Interesting. Interesting. So this is a really good question. Um, you can answer it as politically as you'd like. So, but given your comments about Roger Clemens, do you think he should be in the Hall of Fame? And what about Bonds, Sosa, McGuire? Go for it. So I think I do think Roger and and Bonds should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I think they were, whether they took something or not, I couldn't tell you emphatically. Uh, but they were great players long before that stuff was even around the game. Uh, I think they should, without question, be in. I think they actually will get in if I was, you know, laying money down on it. Um, you know, the other guys, Sammy, I mean, here's, the, here's a question that really needs to be asked. If there are people that were thought to or have been accused of taking performance-enhancing drugs, if there are players already in the Hall of Fame, then you cannot exclude the other ones. Great. That's a great comment. All right. So I have a really good question you're going to enjoy answering. So we have a participant whose 13-year-old grandson plays on a travel ball league, and his position is pitcher. He wants to be a professional player. What advice do you have for him? Get your college degree. Wow. Great answer. Great answer. Okay. Um, and I actually only have um, two more questions. What do you think about the shift? And why don't hitters use that whole field? Someone who obviously doesn't. Um, I don't, I think teams should employ the shift if, if hitters aren't going to make the adjustment. I think hitters need to adjust. Okay, good. And here's a, another question. Should show shy Otani give up pitching? Shohei? Yeah. Uh, Show I would, you know, he, I know he had a couple bad starts this year coming off of Tommy John surgery. Okay. Uh, I would not, this guy was way too talented of a pitcher. I, you know, he, he's got, you know, when he, before Tommy John surgery, he was 97 to a hundred miles an hour and had as a, as a designated hitter, as much power as anyone in the game, this guy He's a he's he's the greatest show on dirt. If when he's healthy, when his shoulder is fine and his elbow is fine, and he can hit and pitch every once a week, this guy's this guy's unbelievable. He and to boot, he's got wide receiver speed. You could stick him in, uh, you could stick him in the NFL, and he could be a wide receiver. That's how fast he is. This 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 guy is fun to fun to watch. Yeah, right. Uh, and there's a couple of uh, 
participants here would like you to know that there's just more than one Cleveland Indian. It's not just all Red Sox fans on this tonight. There's a lot of Cleveland Indian fans as well. They want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we I think we've covered pretty much. Oh, and I have another person who wants you to know, go Tigers. All right, here we go. So, <laughs> so you definitely uh, have the, a... In, yes. I just want to say a couple of things. Sure. One thing. Um, the sports writers have done a, had a field day with you, Brad. They have never had someone who, who's uh, spoken English is as, as good as yours in, in terms of your vocabulary, et cetera. I'll give you a couple examples, okay? Just two. I remember opening up the Sports Illustrated and someone was commenting about your, your reaction to a question. And they, the writer wrote, I've never had a ball player use the word malevolence before. <laughs> That's when I was with the Rockies. I remember and, that. And and lastly, um, you were you were catching a pitcher who had gone to Columbia University, so therefore you had an Ivy League battery. Frank Seminero. And they came up to you. And the the writers asked you. Do you have a special language that only guys in the Ivy League would know when pitching? And you said, yes. Uh, our signals are the number of fingers times pi. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, it turns out I was a smart ass. <laughs> Very good. Well, Brad, so do you have any questions for, uh, oh, wait, I have one more. Oh, okay, this is a good question. So in your opinion, Brad, who's the best catcher in the majors right now? Yeah. Oh, geez, now I got to go through the Rolodex and think of all no, the catchers. Uh, I'm trying to think of everyone that's out there now. That's okay. That's a good while you, question. While you're thinking of that, uh, there's a, a fan here who says, an uh, Astros fan in Ohio who will never forget the home run against Atlanta in the ninth inning. She wants you to know that. And I have, I do have, to, I actually am interested too. What kind of hat is that that you're wearing? This blue hat thing that oh, you've got? I just had, I just saw something come up that said Real Muto. J, uh, Real Muto is actually a solid answer. Whoever put that, whoever just sent that in the he's chat. He's an executive committee member, so he, you know, he's a little smarter <laughs> than most of us. Uh, this hat, you know what's funny? I, oh, this is Travis Matthew, I think. I think it's a golf line. <laughs> this is, well, just to explain myself. So since the, the I was in California when, when the lockdown started, and I came to Cape Cod in Memorial Day, but I have not had my hair cut since the beginning of March. So this is hiding my, my gigantic boss. That's the only reason I'm wearing a hat. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> well, I do have a couple of, um, if you don't mind, one or two more questions and I will let you go. Sure. Uh, great. Great. Uh, someone wants to know, uh, well, remember the Red Sox, well, I'll make you a comment. Remember the Red Sox game a couple of years ago when three Jewish ball players started? Gabe Kapler, the catcher who married Brad, Bradle's sister, Varitek. Oh, yeah, Jason. And one more, I forget. Okay. I don't know. Uh, Euclid? Someone said Euclid? Maybe no. Euclid. Yeah. We're trying to get him to oh, Euclid. There you go. Okay. Kyle Kendricks went to Dartmouth, throws 88 and strikes out batters. Boy, what do you think about him? You know, I've never talked to Kyle Hendricks, but I watch him with pride. Uh, it's the changeup. He's got tremendous changeup. I mean, he's obviously got a good off speed across the board, and he commands the fastball well, but it's the changeup that sets everything else up. He's – the guy's legit. Right. So th this is a good question. Um, when you watch a baseball game, what are you looking for? What are you watching exactly? Uh, now, when I watch, I'm, I'm thinking strategy. Uh, since I've since I've managed, it's basically been all strategy. I, you know, I still appreciate the players' abilities, uh, but I'm kind of trying to think with the manager or, or what would I do in this situation. It's since I've started managing, I do not look at a game without considering strategy. Excellent. All right. I think we. Uh, I think. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. 
this is kind of, I'll ask it. What is your position on sign stealing? Stealing is bad. That's what you said, right? Steal, yeah. Uh, you know what? If it happens on the field of play, I'm okay with it. If it happens with a runner at second or if it happens with base coaches on the, on the field, I'm okay with it because now it's, un, it's incumbent on the catcher and the pitcher to make sure they can't see the signs and or the ball in the glove of the pitcher. You know, nowadays, it's, the teams are so aware of sign stealing. They have multiple sets of signs with a runner on second. They can change them from pitch to pitch, and it's very difficult to figure out which sign they're using. The thing pitchers need to be really aware of is their hand position and the ability of the runner to see into their glove from second base because that can tell them as much. But if the runner, if the runner can see the grip or a change in hand position and they can identify the pitch, well, now they can relay it. And that's free game. So it's incumbent on the pitchers to make sure that is not happening. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, we're going to wrap up now. Um, but I will ask you, because uh, I think these are really good questions. As a manager, do you like the designated hitter or not? Do you like National League America? Well, this year it's everybody. This year it's everybody. Uh, as a manager, I enjoy the, the National League game better. Uh, with, there's a lot more strategy involved when it comes to the pitcher hitting pinch hitting, pitching changes, double switching. Uh, it's, it's more enjoyable. I don't know that we're ever going to see the pitcher hitting again after this year. Ah, interesting. So you think everyone's going to stay converted to... Um, I, don't, I have no inside knowledge. That's kind of my guess. Interesting. Okay. And um, I'll wrap up with asking you, what are you up to now? What are you doing? I'm not doing anything. So I got let go by the Angels at the end of last season. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to still have a contract. Uh, so I'm enjoying my Cape Cod beach house for the, for the entire summer, something I have not done. I have not had a summer off since I signed with the Yankees out of high school. This is the first time I've had a summer off. So I've been uh, on the Cape since Memorial Day. Excellent. Well, Brad, we really, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Norm, for uh, acquiring, getting us, uh, Brad. And thank you to my uh, co-chair, David Kravitz, who really enjoyed all the... So David Kravitz, my co-chair, is a fanatical. He has um, two dogs. One is Fenway and one is Bradley. Brady. Um, Brady. 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 Did I say Bradley? Brady. 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 And, uh, so uh, he's a little despondent this year, but, you know, we'll That's get right. over it. <laughs> we'll get, we'll get Brad, what, um, are you, what are your daughters doing? Is he changing that dog's name? My daughters, uh, my, my younger daughter is going back to NYU in yeah. a few weeks. And uh, my older daughter graduated <laughs> from Dartmouth and is currently working uh, remotely. Great. So, uh, Brad, to give you appreciation, you had all of North America represented here tonight. We were all the way from... Um, California, we have Dodger fans, all the way up to Canada, where we have uh, Buffalo Blue Jay fans and, uh, and every other uh, state in between. So we really, really appreciate well, you doing this for us. Uh, we're going to dedicate a, uh, what we call it, uh, Wine on the Vine, which is a, a charity that FJMC um, has started in your honor. So thank you very much. You'll get a certificate and that's what that's all about so thank you very much you. for everything thank you. no i appreciate it i enjoyed it i hope uh hope everyone else enjoyed it oh we did thank Great. you very much yes thank you take care guys thank you again norm thanks norm that's great my pleasure all right thanks for allowing me to join good night everyone good night good night, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. thank you Great job. It was fun.